Okay, yeah, so now let's, uh, I wanted to share a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so I will actually begin uh, before the World Commission on Dams, what were some of the things and events that happened in the 1980s, 1990s that led to the emergence of the World Commission on Dams. Um, then I will give a brief overview of what was the World Commission on Dams for those who haven't studied it in as much detail as I have. Um, then a few insights on how the World Commission on Dams came to a consensus around large dams more than 20 years ago now. And I will conclude with some thoughts and comments on the legacies and impact of what some have called an experiment in global governance. And I saw uh, the person who um, had that idea, Deborah Moore, in the audience. So it's very nice to see. Um, yeah. But yeah, so where did the word Commission on Dams come from? And a lot of that is related to the negative social and environmental impacts of dams. And that wouldn't surprise many of you. Um, so an obvious negative social impact of dams is the displacement and resettlement that is caused by the dam reservoir. This has been going on ever since dams were built. Here's an example from, from the UK where uh, someone claimed that the flooding of a Welsh uh, village caused uh, Welsh nationalism because that dam supported the English city of Liverpool. Another European example is this Italian village that was flooded just after World War II. So it has since become a tourist attraction and they even integrated uh, the flooded village into their coat of arms. Um, so there's a very long history of displacement and resettlement attached to dams that is near universal. Um, more than 20 years ago, the estimate was that 40 to 80 million people have been displaced by dams. Um, and no one has really done an update on that number. I would imagine it should be much higher now in 2021, uh, much larger number than that. Um, but beyond the obvious impact of displacement and resettlement, dams have downstream impacts on river fisheries. They stop migratory fish routes. They have impacts on floodplain agriculture and cattle grazing where the natural flood pulse is changed. Uh, one person who has written a lot about that is Bill Adams in this book, Wasting the Rain, published in the 1990s. And more recently, this uh, paper by Richter al estimated that it was close to 500 million people who were negatively impacted by dams downstream of them. Um, so again, these are huge numbers um, and explain why there was at one point a need for a World Commission on Dams. In the 1990s, a lot of researchers, activists uh, focused on these impacts. One book that summarizes this quite nicely is this one from published in 1997, which discusses, for example, the South American Chilean Valco Dam, which was built in indigenous territory of the Mapuche people. It flooded an indigenous territory. Uh, indigenous cemetery was hugely controversial. And in fact, there haven't been any further large dam projects in Chile ever since because it was so controversial. Um, but also in Europe, dams have impacted on indigenous territories. Here's a photograph from the campaign against the Norwegian Alta Dam, which took place in the 1980s. And there the indigenous Sami people were protesting because their territory was negatively impacted. And that has had a huge uh, influence in Norwegian society and for the rights of indigenous people. Uh, again, described in this book. Um, but it was very much a global phenomenon. In India, we have the Namada Bachar and Dolan, so the Save the Namada movement, who were protesting against the Sada Sadova Dam and other dams in the Namada Valley, often by staging symbolic drownings. And although this picture is was taken more recently. Many of these uh, protests took place in the 1980s, 1990s. Uh, so that movement was founded in 1989. In Brazil, we have the Movimento dos Atingidos por Barragens. Uh, so the movement of the people affected by dams, again founded in 1991, similar timing. And their motto was water and energy are not commodities. Um, Many of these conflicts are summarized in the book by Patrick McCulley from the International Rivers Network. Again, that network was founded in 1985 and partnered with many uh, social movements, activists around the world. And you, see, you can see this book had support from Arundhati Roy, an Indian author, but also 
uh, anti-dam activist. Um, there was further support from NGOs in Sweden and Switzerland and Thailand. There was very strong uh, global momentum to point out the negative social and environmental impacts on large dams in the 1980s and 90s. Um, one direct result of that was a workshop held in 1997 um, that was convened by IUCN, so the World Conservation Union and the World Bank. And um, here you can see the participants of that workshop. So this was a multi-stakeholder workshop brought together a lot of people from all sides of the dams uh, debate, pro-dam, anti-dam, everything in between. Um, and yeah, the official objective of that workshop was um, to discuss a review of World Bank funded dams. Um, but it became much more than that because of this workshop the idea for World Commission on Dams was first uh, proposed or officially supported by World Bank and IUCN, even though NGOs had been demanding such an independent commission for many years uh, prior to that. Um, it's quite interesting yeah, who was present here. We have representatives from the Namada Bachawan Dolan, from the Burn Declaration, a Swiss NGO, Patrick McCauley was here as well. Um, but also we had very much the pro dam side. So for example, International Commission on Large Dams is very much in favor of dams, lots of engineering companies, uh, International Commission on Irrigation and Drainage. Um, so it's really quite interesting that this very diverse group, although not diverse in terms of gender, um, managed to come to an agreement that there should be a World Commission on Dams. Um, yeah, and I should say it was coordinated by Steiner, who subsequently took a the role as general secretary of World Commission on Dams. So there was a link there. Um, here's just a brief timeline of further events that happened in the lead up to World Commission on Dams. Um, in 1993, World Bank withdrew support for India's Sada Sadova Dam, so the one that I mentioned earlier, the Namada Pachandon and were protesting against, although the project continued afterwards and was finally completed uh, four years ago in 2017. But it still, it was a hugely important symbolic victory that the World Bank withdrew from that project in 1993 because of the way that uh, social and impacts were managed and resettlement were managed or better said, not managed. Uh, um, another important event was in 1994, the signing of a declaration by more than 300 NGOs, which called for an end to World Bank funding for large dams. Again, usually symbolic because it was signed in Mani Bailey, a village that was going to be flooded by Sada Sarova. Um, in 1995, another very big dam uh, um, lost the support of the World Bank. So that was Nepal's Adam Free Dam. Um, again, a result of campaigning, campaigning uh, pointing out the economic uh, inviability and many other things of that dam. In 1996, the World Bank's internal review quite nicely said there was potential to improve the social and environmental mitigation measures around large dams. Um, and finally, in 1997, just one year before WCD, there was another global declaration, this time held in Brazil in Curitiba, where dam affected people called for a right to participation and consent in dam planning and construction. Um, so all of this was very well uh, coordinated on a global level. Uh, and yeah, if there was one main message about the time before World Commission Dance, it should be that the conflict was very intense. And yeah, it was very difficult for both sides, the pro dam side and the um, side against dams. Now, coming towards the second part of this uh, webinar, um, I wanted to give a brief overview of what was the World Commission on Dams, what was it trying to achieve, how did it work? Um, and in one slide, here's a very quick overview of all the main characteristics. So as I mentioned, it was conceived in 1997 or agreed, I should say, by World Bank and IUCN. It had the support of the president of the World Bank at the time, James Wolfenson, who said it's important to involve more stakeholders in development. Um, the hope was that it could resolve the conflicts between supporters and opponents of large dams 
both through dialogue between stakeholders and through research and evidence. Um, there were 12 expert commissioners that had a secretariat in South Africa in Cape Town, and there was also a forum of 68 members from different stakeholder organizations that were meant to review the work or check on the work of the World Commission on Dams. Um, and it produced two main outputs. One was a very large knowledge base, and I'll talk a little bit more in the coming slides. And second was a final report that also made recommendations for best practice alongside the review of the evidence on large dams. Um, so here are the 12 commissioners. Um, in the middle, you can see the chair of World Commission Dams was Kader Asmal, a very interesting figure. So he had been a lifelong anti-apartheid activist, a human rights lawyer who was in exile in Ireland for a long part for many years until apartheid ended in South Africa in 1994, uh, when he moved back and then became active in politics there. First as Minister of Water, then he was Minister of Education. Um, and so he was the chair of World Commission on Dams, uh, had a very diverse uh, background in many respects. Vice chair was from India, Lakshmi Chand Jain. Um, and although at the time he had roles with the Indian government, he had been high commissioner to South Africa at one point. He had mostly been a social activist uh, for most of his life. The Secretary General, I have mentioned, Achim Steiner. And in his case, it's maybe more interesting what happened after World Commission Dams since he first became the head of IUCN, then head of UNEP, and he is the current head of the United Nations Development Program. Um, so yeah, clearly he took on new leadership roles after World Commission on Dams. And then here we have, on the one hand, four activists who looked at all different aspects of dams, indigenous rights, um, the rights of resettled people, uh, development itself, environmental impacts of dams, uh, two academics, uh, two professors, Ted Scudder from California, Jose Goldenberg from the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, he had been working in uh, the energy aspect of dams. He had also had roles in government in Brazil, uh, was in charge of implementing dam projects, whereas Scudder had studied the impacts of dams on people in Africa and Asia, on resettled people. And to conclude the group, we had also the pro dam voices, two engineers, Jan Beltrup, who had been building dams for many decades, former president of the International Commission of Large Dams, and Göran Lindahl, CEO of APB. Uh, the large global engineering company. And finally, Don Blackmore from Australia, who was uh, working with the Moray Darling Basin Commission. So we had lots of experience managing conflicts around water, multi-stakeholder processes. Um, these three, 12 people had the mandate to review the development effectiveness of large dams. And in that sense, I think it's quite interesting for the future dams community, since the objective there is in somewhat similar studying the effectiveness of large dams, but also assessing or making recommendations for best practice. Uh, how can you improve dam planning and management? Again, I think an objective that was Commission Dams shared with future dams, although of course on a much larger, much more global scale than future dams. Um, <clears throat> Here's a quick overview of the process. Um, the evidence gathering was structured around thematic reviews that covered any imaginable aspect except the engineering bit, which they felt was already well developed. So social impact of dams and impact on indigenous people, legal aspects, the finance of dams, everything was covered in these thematic reviews, which were individual studies out contracted to consultants or researchers and became part of the knowledge base. They also did individual case studies around individual dams in many parts of the world, mostly quite old dams because World Commission dams didn't want to get involved in ongoing projects and then become part of those political conflicts. And many of these were not very good dams. Uh, example, the Tukuroi Dam in Brazil, even the most pro dam people I have interviewed were saying it was not a very good project at the time, built in the middle of nowhere, producing energy for demand that was not there. Um, and then there was a quantitative component, a cross-check survey, where they tried to compare 
uh, many more than 100 large dams on different criteria, although that was quite challenging at the time. Um, getting dam builders and dam managers to agree to share data was not an easy task. And finally, part of this building the knowledge base were regional consultations in four different world regions. So in North Africa, Latin America, East Asia and South Asia, stakeholders were invited to give evidence and testimony to that group of commissioners and from all sides again, from the pro dam to the anti dam government, business, dam affected people, they were all invited to talk about how dams had worked or not worked in their respective region. Um, and those were quite interesting events too. Um, so all that evidence was meant to feed into the final report, which you can see here on the right, um, but the final report also had uh, recommendations that were meant to be based on that evidence. And finally, all that evidence was supposed to be disseminated in a global process. Um, and although, of course, I can't share all the content of this final report, I wanted to pass on a few key messages, which I think, again, might be interesting for the future dams community, many dam researchers today. There are many lessons that were learned then that I think we can take up again today. Um, one recommendation that the World Commission on Dams made was to look at dam planning in with five key decision points. So following a very structured, very systematic process to planning that started with an assessment of development needs rather than with an idea of building a dam. So a non-dam option was always part of the planning if that was a way to meet development needs. And this sounds quite basic, but yeah, it has often not been done. For example, that Norwegian dam that I mentioned earlier was built and even today the Norwegian government conceded actually this didn't meet any real needs. It was more or less not needed and all these conflicts were for very little benefit. Um, so pointing out that there should be a non-dam option to meet development needs seems obvious, but was really a big insight and something that I think is relevant today as well. Um, and then World Commission on Dams developed seven strategic priorities. Um, and then there were many more detailed guidelines and principles underneath these seven strategic priorities, which again, I think were relevant then. They continue to be relevant today, they're quite uh, universal. Um, so from the top, they said it's important to gain public acceptance. So develop dams with the people who are affected rather than against them, involve them closely. And the idea was if you involve people closely, you can reduce conflict, you can reduce protests, maybe dam building will become smoother, although maybe that was also a little bit idealistic. Um, then the idea of comprehensive options assessment, I think, is clear from what I have said. So the idea of considering um, dams and the alternatives to dams uh, rather than only dams. Then the commission recommended to look at existing dams because many conflicts had never really been resolved. There were cases where dams had displaced people 30 years after no compensation had been paid. They were much worse off. Um, so the idea was, well, before building new dams, we should also fix problems of the past. And then this priority around sustaining rivers and livelihoods was very much to prevent negative environmental impacts and the repercussions for rural livelihoods. Um, the idea of recognizing entitlements and sharing benefits was that dams should make people better off. So no one should be left worse off if a dam is built. Again, I think it makes a lot of sense. And probably a lot of dam builders would agree that this is a sensible principle, but one that is often not uh, implemented in practice. And finally, ensuring compliance was about how can you ensure that rules are followed, that regulations are followed, because often once you commit to a dam, you have committed a lot of money and it's very difficult to walk out of it if something doesn't go according to plan. And that is one of the additional challenges with dam building. Um, so here, the idea was how can we uh, ensure that there's bigger compliance with existing rules and regulations around dam planning. And the seventh priority was uh, about the transboundary dimension of dam building. 
Um, so the idea is if, if a dam impacts a neighboring country, then those two countries should share on the benefits. And I think that is something that might be very relevant in the Nile Basin today, where a dam is built and there has been some debate between neighboring countries uh, around its benefits and management. So to sum up uh, again, very briefly, what are some of the key features of these recommendations? So on the one hand, we have a mix of policy goals and also of methodological options like the options assessment. What is, what is very clear, I think, overall is that World Commission on Dams wanted to reduce negative social and environmental impacts wherever possible. A lot of these recommendations have that in mind. Um, yeah, also what is very clear, they wanted to assess development needs and alternatives early on. Um, and they developed a rights and risk approach to dam planning, which meant that if someone's rights were affected by a dam or someone was at risk because of a dam, then these people should be made part of the planning process. Uh, and part of that was the idea of giving indigenous peoples the right of free, primed, and informed consent if a dam was going to impact on indigenous territories. Just because so many dams have been built in the territories which tend to be remote areas, uh, and that is also a lot of dams are built. So it made sense that these indigenous peoples should have more of a say in dam planning. And another key feature was this idea of turning users into beneficiaries. Uh, again, a very simple but very uh, straightforward idea that came out of the WCD recommendations. Um, yeah, so far for the brief overview of what was WCD, what was it trying to achieve? And um, now I would like to move on to where did these recommendations come from? How did this very diverse group of people uh, come to an agreement, a consensus around large dams? We have the pro dam side, the anti dam side, some people in the middle. Um, and before I talk about that journey towards the consensus, just a brief note on the methodology. Um, so I interviewed people who were part of the WCD process uh, 20 years after WCD, which was an interesting experience. So I had a report from the World Commission on Dams and I tried to trace people who worked for it in the secretariat, who were the commissioners, research fellows, consultants, uh, stakeholders, observers, and so on. Uh, many of them advertised on LinkedIn that they were part of World Commission on Dams, which was nice. But more than that, I thought it was nice that a lot of people advertised on their web profiles that 20 years ago they were part of this process, even though it was may have been not a very long time. It was clear a lot of people were very proud that they had been uh, working for World Commission on Dams. Here's just one example. Um, and yeah, so here are a few quotes from people that I have interviewed and their own views on how they managed to reach a consensus on large dams. Um, so here's one person talking about the human dimension of that, the personal level. Others pointed out the leadership of Kader Asmal, of Achim Steiner, uh, the use of evidence, and also just how quickly World Commission on Dams worked and how well it was managed. Um, so to summarize that, one thing that came up again and again in interviews is how important it was that the World Commission on Dams wasn't forced to represent anyone. So although we had different stakeholder groups, NGOs, business, uh, academics, government, inside World Commission on Dams, they were free to talk freely, to make compromises, to negotiate, and not check back with you know, the association of uh, the International Hydropower Association, the, uh, all the different uh, stakeholder groups. Uh, and so that the good personal relationships that people had were really the uh, way to reach consensus. Um, also, the very good leadership from Kader Asma, who, as I mentioned, was very active in the anti-apartheid movement. So it makes sense that he had skills to share in bringing very diverse groups of people together and making them come to an agreement. Um, Again, the role of evidence was mentioned by many respondents, how important that was to reach a consensus. Um, and not 
And one function I think that is often overlooked that it's not just finding the evidence, but that if you make the conversation about evidence, you can bring the different sides together. So although some people may support dams, others may oppose dams, they may agree on the evidence that dams have negative impacts on people who are displaced. And then of course, there may be different priorities, uh, preferences. What do you do about that? But just making the conversation about collecting the evidence was a very useful tool inside the World Commission on Dams for bringing people together. And finally, a lot of people mentioned the, the very tight time horizon as a very positive feature of World Commission on Dams, which was interesting and surprising in a way. So people said because they knew they had to meet this deadline of finishing the work in the year 2000, that helped them work together. And it would have been harder if there was an unspecified end date. Maybe people hadn't agreed to make compromises or to discuss, discuss with each other. And also the role of the technical support was mentioned uh, in enabling a consensus. Uh, here's another quote from an interview, which I quite liked, where people just talk about how, how different people were. Uh, meeting inside World Commission on Dams. These are two stakeholders, one an engineer from Hydro-Quebec, so a Canadian engineering company, another one a uh, representative from International Rivers Network. They met inside a uh, stakeholder forum meeting and they were able to have a conversation and relate on a personal level. So making a consensus was really about the process of bringing people together as much as uh, the actual decisions or recommendations that were made. Um, here's another opinion that I've heard, which was interesting, where someone actually said, well, was this a consensus or was this maybe actually one side winning the war on dams? Uh, and although this yeah, was maybe a bit of an extreme example to say, well, comparing dams to slavery, here the opinion was, well, World Commission on Dams, one side won, and that was the more critical side. Um, winning by providing better evidence, providing better arguments. And so this idea of a consensus may be obscures winners and losers. This is another opinion that I've heard. Um, and yeah, so to sum up a few lessons from the World Commission on Dams for how to reach a consensus on a very difficult topic, such a, topic such as large dams. We can use these ingredients of political skill, leadership, carefully, have this careful balance between are we representing certain groups, but also are we free to negotiate independently as individuals, as persons, um, having a very fixed or very strict time horizon that we're working to enabling a consensus. And finally, do we have good uh, technical support and also uh, politically informed support. So inside the Secretariat of WCD, everyone was very clear that dams are a highly politicized topic and that they had to work around that. Um, but I think it's also important, as I mentioned, it's to consider when we talk about a consensus, are we talking about consensus around evidence or are we talking about the consensus around political action? And one does not necessarily follow from the other. So you may have agreement on what is the evidence, but you may not agree what is the best way forward. Um, and then also, are we just talking about the consensus as a process where we agree that we need to move forward by a consensus decision, or is the actual consensus about what the decisions are about, about the content? And that is not always the same thing. Uh, one example from inside World Commission on Dams, where there was a 100% consensus on content, is a dissent note that was written by one of the commissioners, Sonia Patka, uh, Indian anti dam activist, uh, included a two page note at the very end of the final report of World Commission on Dams, specifying a few concerns that she had about large dams as a strategy for development in general. Um, and that including those additional comments and concerns in the report allowed her um, to um, sign off the final report. So coming to, to that agreement. Um, and um, 
now in this final part of the webinar, I wanted to talk a little bit about some legacies and the impact of the experiment in global governance, again, a quote taken from a 2010 paper from a special issue on World Commission on Dams, 10 years after World Commission on Dams. Um, one thing that, or one quote that I found nice that I wanted to share was how many people who participated in WCD found this wasn't actually a commission on dams, this was a commission on development in general. Although the, the debates were around dams, actually all the debates applied to development in general. So we had human rights, sustainability concerns, environment, social concerns, all of these things that are important in development could be attached to that single object, the large dam. And, um, so many people, although they may have moved on in their career, they may not have worked on dams anymore. Actually, they took many lessons from World Commission on Dams. Um, many people talked a lot about the personal uh, impact that working for World Commission on Dams had on them. Here is one example of the engineer on World Commission on Dams, Jan Veltrup. Uh, he was very impacted by seeing resettled people not benefiting from large dam projects. Um, and so there was some learning going on from for many people, both on a on the evidence level, but also on an emotional level of understanding that actually yes, uh, people who were resettled without proper compensation were suffering quite a bit, and that something needed to be done around that. Um, and this personal dimension was also around bringing opposing sides together, which I mentioned earlier. So a lot of people that I've interviewed said World Commission on Dams really helped them understand that the best way forward in a difficult situation is to bring everyone to the table, make them work together rather than against each other. Um, and here we have yeah, an engineer and an academic in the field working together. Um, and yeah, many people have just said how nice it was that this was possible at the time. Um, on a more technical level, what have been the impacts of World Commission on Dams? There was a big hope among those people who participated that this would become a new global standard of reference for how to build dams, how to improve dam planning and management. Um, but here you can see the logos of three organizations um, that united briefly after submission, uh, sorry, publication of the final report in the year 2000 to write a letter saying that they rejected the findings. They thought the process was not fair. Uh, yeah, basically these three organizations, so the Commission on Irrigation and Drainage, International Commission on Large Dams, International Hydropower Association, some of the most important pro-dam organizations, um, they did not agree to World Commission on Dams and that certainly didn't help with making World Commission on Dams a global standard of reference. Um, Another organization that had a mixed awkward reaction to World Commission on Dams was the World Bank. So although the World Bank uh, wasn't quite as negative in their reaction as these uh, professional associations, they said they would only support WCD in principle, the general guidelines, but not the more specific recommendations that were being made. Um, so although World Bank had been an important organization sponsoring the whole process. In the end, they did not adopt the recommendations of World Commission on Dams as their own, which was a big disappointment to many people at the time. Um, and yeah, here's one quote uh, around that, where people said, well, there were people inside the World Bank uh, who decided that this report was not in the West Bank's interest, and this is very vague terms, but based on published material by uh, John Briscoe, so the World Bank senior water advisor himself, it's very clear that he was one of the leading forces who lobbied inside the World Bank not to support World Commission on Dams. So he published an opinion piece in the year 2010 saying how much he disagreed with the process of World Commission on Dams and the recommendations that were made. Um, other people have, yeah, yeah, this has really caused a lot of upset among people who were invested in World Commission on Dams. Um, speaking of alternative facts, alternative reality. Uh, so 20 years after, people were still quite angry about 
how the World Bank had reacted uh, to the publication of the World Commission on Dams report. Um, and that came a bit of a surprise to me. Um, in another form of impact that the World Commission on Dams has had is on the industry, so on the International Hydropower Association. Although I just mentioned that in the year 2000, that association rejected World Commission on Dams completely uh, over a process of many years, they actually became one of the driving forces in developing this hydropower sustainability assessment protocol uh, in collaboration with some NGOs like WWF, Transparency International, some southern countries like Zambia, northern countries like Germany, Iceland, China was involved in this. Um, and that protocol claims to be one of the legitimate successes to WCD. Although, of course, many people who worked for WCD would dispute that. Um, but certainly the industry felt they had to do something and this is the tangible outcome of what they propose as an alternative way forward. Um, so they suggested whenever you build a dam, you should look at these many criteria they would be assessed on a scale from one to five in different uh, uh, stages of a planning process. Um, and then the idea was, well, you move from a very low standard from one to the best possible standard five on all of these indicators, which if you look at it, yeah, it looks very progressive, very good. Um, the main issue with this protocol is really that it's not been adopted very much. Uh, a lot of the case studies that have been done so far were on dams in Europe, in Iceland, in Austria, where um, the governance context overall is probably already quite good. Um, and the other problem is that there is no conditionality to move from a poor standard to a high standard. So if you do this assessment and you find that actually a dam doesn't score very highly, there is no mechanism in this uh, protocol to force people to move to the highest possible standard. Um, and so the optimists will say, well, this will certainly come in the future. The pessimists will say, well, this is distracting from the negative impacts of dams. Um, and everyone should be free to choose uh, their own point of view on that. Um, yeah, coming to the very end of the presentation. Um, so here are a few conclusions or preliminary conclusions um, since we're still working on writing this research up. Um, one thing that cannot be stressed enough is that the process of World Commission on Dams was just as important as the outcome. So although the report had a lot of influence, people continuously to read it, cite it. Uh, the process of bringing better, uh, together opposing sites in a conflict was just as important, uh, in reducing conflict and in changing the outlook of many different people who were part of that uh, global process. Then, one finding that for me personally I found quite interesting is that how global governance could be shaped so much by individual characters that there's such a personal dimension to it. I went into it naively thinking, oh, there's these global organizations, they will have very rigorous procedures, but actually a lot of these decisions can be influenced by powerful individuals. So both on the pro uh, World Commission on Dam side, where you had very able leadership by the chair, by the secretary, but also on the a negative side where, yeah, World Bank senior water advisor went around the world lobbying different countries to not adopt the recommendations made by World Commission on Dams. Um, another perhaps general conclusion from this research might be that an initiative like World Commission on Dams can bring people together. You can reach a consensus by investing much time developing these personal relationships but then you have a consensus between that group. You don't have a consensus between the entire stakeholders. So uh, in the case of the World Commission on Dams, just because we had the pro dam side and anti dam side inside the commission agree, that didn't mean that suddenly uh, dam builders and activists would agree on a global scale. And I think that is an inevitable. And everyone who engages in such a process should be clear about that from the start. And the last, um, conclusion is that although research and evidence is positive and helpful on its own, it cannot overcome the political impasse, the political conflict, um, which, yeah, again, looks self-evident, but I think it's worth restating since 
there have been many other global initiatives that have started to just lead to evidence-based um, uh, policy making and thinking that just collecting the evidence is enough, but actually that political negotiation between different options is just as important. Um, anyone who would like to read more about this uh, can refer to these two papers, which are already out. And as I said, we are working on several papers that are currently under preparation, uh, hopefully be coming out either this year or next year. Um, yeah, thank you very much. And any questions, I'd be happy to take them now and also to receive them by email later on. Cheers. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I will link. Uh or website where you can find the papers. But if you have a question, uh, please raise your hand and uh, Eddie's uh, raise their hand. So we're just gonna please unmute yourself and ask away, Eddie. Thank you. Uh, hi, hi, Christopher. Hi, everyone. I'm the uh, uh, CEO of the International Hydropower Association. Um, so it's, it's very interesting for uh, me and the uh, colleagues to, to hear about this. Um, uh, get a bit more history. I'm, I wasn't around at IHA um, at the time. I've only been uh, involved for under two years. Um, so I um, was learning the history um, as we went along and I was uh, disappointed to uh, to hear that, uh, uh, if this is correct, that uh, the IHA rejected um, the dam's finding, the commission's findings when it came out. Um, look, as you indicate, Christopher, um, from then on, I think the uh, the attitude changed quite a bit, um, and I'm, I'm quite interested in 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 what was learned from that commission. As you say, IHA then did convene a whole set of uh, environmental and social and governance NGOs together with international financial institutions like the World Bank, with governments with. Uh, and the companies to form this set of tools which became the hydropower assessment protocol. Um, you're quite right, I think, to say that that's a good set of tools, but the challenge has been around adoption. Um, I think it's slightly wrong to suggest that that's sort of geographically skewed. I think um, actually there has been um, use of the tools all around the world, but not enough. I think that is definitely the case. And what we're doing now is we're trying to get it much more embedded into financial systems. So you've got the, the um, Climate Bonds Initiative has accepted um, the, the tools, good practice against the protocol as aligned with green um, bonds requirements, EU taxonomy accepts it for sustainable investment. It's aligned with the World Bank, the IFC sustainability frameworks. Um, we in IHA are becoming a values-based organization which present and represent just the, the sustainable end of the day. So um, uh, we are um, we are uh, have adopted um, a IHA charter around sustainability. I just wanted to say that going forward, it seems that 21 years on, we need an answer to the, the commission, you need to say what's changed, and particularly in the new context of, cl of climate change and the need to tackle climate change. And whether we like it or not, hydropower is an essential element of the uh, energy transition. The only way you're going to balance wind and solar, which we need a lot more of, is by, by uh, hydropower or gas or coal. And um, that's the only long proven technology around long efficient energy storage. So um, we need a new declaration which says 21 years on, this is where hydropower, sustainable hydropower industry is. We've learned some lessons. We commit to good practice and beyond. There's no excuse, but we are a nature-based organization. We need to be sustainable around. We are establishing um, a San Jose Declaration in September, which is open for consultation now. I don't know that it will, the consultation will be as grand or as, uh, as wide as the um, World Commission, but it does uh, seek to 
move the debate along, create an updated narrative for the role in the energy transition. So I, I encourage, it's not really a question, it's a comment. I encourage people to get involved in, in uh, the consultation on the San Jose Declaration. I encourage people to register for the World um, Hydropower uh, Congress, which is in September and is free. It's all online, it's free for the first time. And that we will be having further conversations on how to improve practice, improve enabling policies and change the narrative, um, what needs to be done to change the narrative. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you so much for these comments and I'm really happy to, to hear them and that you're here uh, to respond to that presentation. Um, and yeah, I think we both agree that more adoption of that protocol will be an improvement and about the geographical range. I think that is a fair point. I should say my own research was more focused on the history of what Commissioner done. So I'm not the person to criticize the hydrofoil assessment protocol on that point. Um, but also, yeah, as, as we have seen, the International Hydropower Association turned around quite a bit from that position in the year 2002, where we are today. Um, and so, yeah, it's just quite nice to hear contemporary perspective. What I said about people disagreeing on the impact and how positive this protocol is, that reflects what I have been told in my interviews. Um, so some people were quite positive about it, some people have been involved personally. Others, as usual, will be more critical, and I don't really want to personally take a standpoint on that since that's been the main focus of my research. Uh, question, Eddie. Uh, got a million first, and maybe we do a couple questions at a time because we've got some uh, hands raised. So, million first, and then Lakshmi after that, and then I'm going to move on to Deborah, Kimbo, and uh, uh, the chat right after that. So, million, if you'd like to go. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Christopher. That was really a very insightful presentation. I, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, my Question is, uh, if, if you have had the chance to look into how the report was received by uh, nation states, national governments, on whether there are evidences of, of the re some of the insights from the report were picked up or uh, to the contrary were rejected by, by national governments. Uh, that would be uh, one of my questions. And then the second question would be, uh, how you think, again, the report uh, influenced civil society um, actions towards dams. Um, my reading of the dam is, you know, it, it's not, um, it, it, it doesn't reject large dams, but it puts forward some, you know, so to say, uh, practical actions that they thought would, would, would help uh, dams to be less less um less how, how how would i say it less destructive uh so you would you'd assume that you know civil societies may pick some of them some of the principles so do you think it in, in any way influenced civil society movements towards dams uh are there any evidence around that that would be great to hear thank you yeah thank you again for attending and for this two great question um so the first one i think i can answer quite quickly around how it influenced national governments and whether national governments took up these recommendations. Um, so one country that has made it a formal requirement is Germany. So the German Development Bank, when they found dams, one of the requirements is to meet the criteria of the World Commission on Dams. European Union has that criterion as well. I think Sweden has been very supportive. And apart from that, there have been a lot of national dialogue processes. So although that is not the same as the making a requirement to meet the criteria. There have been meetings between pro dam and anti dam side stakeholders in different countries, such as South Africa itself. There was an interesting process in Nepal that was done uh, and a few other countries around the world. Um, so that was another impact on a government or national level, just uh, keeping up that dialogue. In terms of how has this World Commission on Dams influenced civil society? So, Immediately after the year 2000, there was a very um, sense of victory almost because this World Commission dams 
took up many of the key demands that activists have had over many years. Um, and so um, one would have to distinguish between what happened in, around the year 2000 and where are we now. And I haven't done as much on the present situation to give a very qualified answer, but my sense is that um, activism has reduced somewhat if compared to the 1980s and 1990s, it's still there. It's much more technically competent than it used to be. So nowadays, maybe people don't fight so much in the street, but they will fight in court, citing the details in an agreement in the contracts. They will be informed around that. And often people will say, well, have we learned anything from World Commission on Dams since then? So having that report has been very useful for civil society to give legitimacy and authority to their claims. Um, they might often say, well, we should really just do what this global commission recommended. So in that sense, it has been taken up. Just thanks, Chris. Uh, Lakshmi, would you like to ask your question? Hello, I had a question as well. Sorry, Kimbo. Yeah, we are going to come to Deborah and you right after this. Sorry. Oh, okay. But can I go ahead? No. Well, uh, let's do Lakshmi first. And then after Chris answers this one, uh, I'm going to move to Deborah and Kimbo. Is that all right? All right, Lakshmi, please go ahead. Uh, we can't hear them. Chris, can you hear them? No. All right. I'm just going to uh, read that. You can see it in the chat as well. Was muted. Uh, yeah. Environment climate change considerations don't always intersect. While there are highly likely synergies in the long run, political actors might see hydropower as an quote unquote easier way to transition out of fossil fuels. Given this emphasis on energy transitions, do you think that criteria climate change resilience and mitigation has gained more prominence than before? Did any of the uh, WCD officials talk about this? That's the first question. The second one is, did WCD's work, especially on rehabilitation, influence other domains such as conservation where displacement slash relocation has been a practice? Um, yeah, again, really interesting questions. And I think the first one is a little bit about the green status of hydropower, isn't it? Because on the one hand, there is this claim that it will reduce greenhouse gas emissions, helps reduce climate change. But on the other hand, um, it has many proven negative environmental impacts. Um, and so in terms of what the World Commission on Dams worked around that topic, uh, they commissioned actually some of the very first studies on the uh, greenhouse gas emissions that come out of dam reservoirs. It was done by a group of researchers from Brazil. And ever since then, the evidence base has been growing that some dam reservoirs can actually cause more greenhouse gas emissions than they save. Um, I don't think anyone has gotten the formula yet, what are the criteria to determine that, but dams in tropical areas that flood a lot of forest, for example, are not very positive from a greenhouse gas emissions perspective. A dam that might be in the mountain area, not flooding a lot of vegetation, could be beneficial in terms of that energy transition. Um, so, yeah, my answer would be around the year 2000. That was a very new topic, and awareness was just growing. I think that is one example where science has moved along a lot. And actually, future dance colleagues are working on that too, as far as I know. Um, the second question whether WCD influenced other domains beyond dams. And um, of course, it's always difficult to make a direct link of causation. Was this World Commission dams causing something else? But there have certainly been developments in global development, global policy that were part of World Commission dams that also apply to other fields. So earlier in the presentation, I mentioned free prior and informed consent for indigenous people when a dam affected indigenous territories. And that is a principle that was controversial, that was new, that was quite radical at the time of the World Commission on Dams, but has since been taken up by mainstream development organizations such as the World Bank, 
and it's certainly applied beyond stamps. Um, so that is one example of how World Commission on Dams has influenced other policy sectors. Um, and I'm sure there would be other examples where you can say, well, what World Commission on Dams recommended then influenced or was similar to other global processes. But yeah, certainly we can't say it was a direct link, causal link in that sense. Cheers. Thanks, Chris. Uh, let's just do both set of questions at the same time. So Deborah, I'll let you go first and then Kimbo after that. And then Chris, you can answer both of them at the same time. Well, thank you. I'm Deborah Moore. I was one of the 12 commissioners. So um, it's gratifying to see that people are still interested in this topic 21 years later. I have many thoughts and comments to make, which we don't have time for. Um, uh, so who knows? Maybe I'll write a blog or something um, <laughs> to, to respond to some of this. Um, I, I'm going to pose a question, but then maybe also have a couple of comments. Um, and I think really my interest is how can the lessons that Christopher, you laid out and other lessons that you didn't touch on, how can these lessons be applied now um, particularly in this era of political polarization, um, but also in this era uh, where things have gotten worse. And Mr. Rich asked, you know, well, what has changed in the last 21 years? And uh, you just mentioned a couple things where science has moved on. Um, so the IPCC now looks at um, the methane impacts and greenhouse gas impacts of dams and the science is showing um, that large reservoirs, even how they're operated, um, and the, in, the annual inputs of organic matter, not just what was flooded at the time, um, means that reservoirs are a source of greenhouse gas emissions significantly globally. Since uh, WCD, biodiversity loss, aquatic biodiversity loss is higher. Um, global economic inequities are higher. Human rights abuses are ongoing. Um, indigenous rights are being violated. And free prior and informed consent is not for indigenous communities, which was what was in the WCD report. It's not only because indigenous people are you know, directly affected by large dams, it's because they actually have legal rights that are being violated. And those legal rights are just as important as you know, contractual rights of hydropower companies or construction companies. And that's part of what the WCD was trying to do is level the playing field and have people understand uh, that these rights are equal under the law uh, and should be recognized. Um, so in some ways, you know, a lot has changed in the last 20 plus years, um, but unfortunately in some in some cases, I think, uh, going the wrong way. And so how can we use these lessons and, yes, operationalize them? Um, I think there are many instances where the WCD has pushed ideas forward, like free prior informed consent. Um, and so I appreciate that you say that that was kind of radical at the time. But I don't think we've lived up to some of these um, ideas. So for me personally, um, you know, I think we have very few free flowing remaining rivers left. Um, and so are we going to really step up and say, you know, should we not build main stem dams anymore? Uh, for one thing, for example, um, you know, what other things can we really do to protect what remains? Because honestly, we all depend on a thriving ecosystem. Um, and it's not just kind of, you know, a mechanistic commodity. And I think those kinds of linkages we're seeing even more so today. So I guess my overall question after all those comments, and I have many more comments, but um, is how can those lessons be applied in this moment of incredible political polarization? And how can the people on this call even, how can we uh, advance the kind of collaboration um, and deep problem solving that's necessary if we're going to move forward. Yeah, thank you so much for these comments. And of course, yeah, I couldn't 
cover all the lessons and it's nice to hear from you also what were some of the lessons that you found relevant after 21 years. Um, in terms of the question, how can we apply uh, the lessons from the experience of World Commission on Dams? I think that is for each one of us who's in the call to decide and implement. So one first step would be to say, well, we may not dis we may not agree with the International Hydropower Association, but still we would rather work with them, participate in that process rather than say, well, we reject it altogether. I think that might be one step. Um, but everyone has really, not just in the field of dams, it's needs to look at how who can I work with who is actually not on my side and who is open to dialogue and have that dialogue. I think that is a very broad uh, lesson that may need to be translated in many different contexts and there's no universal way to do so. Um, so that is probably not the most satisfying answer, but probably one that uh, yeah, you might expect or that would um, repeat the um, experience from the World Commission on Dams. Um, and yeah, as I said, I'm ha happy to take half the conversation and if you have further comments and questions. Um, I don't know how we are doing on time. Uh, no, I just wanted to thank Deborah for her comments. Uh, those are really valuable given the context of talking and everything. Uh, we've got, Kimbo's been waiting, so uh, I'll let them go. And there's another question from Craig in the chat. Uh, so first, Kimbella, and then I'll do two questions at the same time. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this uh, webinar, but also, uh, please, for this uh, enlightening, bring us to, to speed with uh, what has happened since two, since uh, 2000. I'm just wondering if you, if I take it from Deborah, Deborah, I think has sort of touched what, what I wanted to ask, but, but precisely, if, uh, Chris, if, what could be the miss the, the issues that could that can be uh, considered if WCD process was to start now in in, in our times because uh, many things are happening for example in this region I'm, I'm from East Africa but you could you can see that the the dams are now built uh, across borders I think cross border as cross border projects so is there anything else for example apart from that that could the WCD if they start today they would now say we miss this one or oh, one or two three thank you uh chris i'm also going to re read craig's uh okay. looking at the time i'm going to read their question and you can answer both of them uh what were the reasons given by icid and i called for the rejection of the wcd report uh they say they presume they were considered in detail not just a knee-jerk reaction that's the question so you can take both of them thank you yeah. Um, so the first question, yeah, again, very interesting. What would a contemporary World Commission on Dams have to discuss or do? Um, and I think that is an interesting question also for the future dams group of researchers who have to tackle many of the same question. Um, although it has not been the main focus of my research, I would say surprisingly many of those issues are just as relevant today. And in a way, there is no need for a new World Commission on Dams because the old one is still there and the recommendations are still there. Um, one area that has moved on since then is the science, as was pointed out also by Deborah. So we now know a lot more about the specific impacts of dams. And that is something that you know you could translate into more specific guidelines. Um, another thing that has changed since the year 2000 is the role of private developers. So in the past, in the previous century, a lot of dams were funded by state governments. It was a sort of national task to build a dam, whereas nowadays a lot of dams are built with, uh, built with the support of a lot of private developers where you can't even know who is actually funding this dam. It is very complex. Um, so that is an issue that needs to be addressed, although I can't really say how because it is a very difficult one and one that colleagues uh, inside Future Times have been doing research on. Uh, um, yeah, but certainly dam finance, I think, is one thing that is very different in 2021 to considering the situation to, uh, in the year 2000. Um, yeah, the second question was around why those three associations rejected the report in the year 2000, and it wasn't just a knee-jerk reaction, but um, yeah, um, 
it was considered and detailed. Yes, so that letter, I think it might still be publicly available if anyone would like to read it. But to summarize the reasons, um, one big complaint that these associations had was that they felt they weren't sufficiently involved in the process. Um, so they had hoped they were able to comment on that final report by the World Commission Dimes, these 300 plus pages. Uh, each one of these had a member in the stakeholder forum. Um, but then that didn't happen and that uh, upset these um, yeah, uh, representatives of those associations. Um, in terms of the content of the report, although th that letter also claimed they disagreed with many of the recommendations, they found it was too idealistic, too critical of large dams. I have spoken to members of those associations exploring different parts of the recommendations and surprisingly on a broad level there is agreement even the pro dam side will agree that it's important to involve local people um, they will agree that it's important to manage environmental impacts i don't think nowadays anyone is actively planning to build a dam uh, with the intention to ignore those things it's just there's very strong disagreement whether it is done properly or not um, but on this very abstract level, should we consider resettled people, displaced people, should we consider environmental impacts? I think there is, isn't actually so much disagreement. It's more about the practice the implementation where much more work needs to be done. Um, yes, I don't know. I hope that answered the question a little bit. Yeah, I think that should, uh, yeah, no, uh, thanks, Chris. We've got like a few minutes to wrap this up. I'd just like to thank you for your excellent presentation. Uh, I think Bill's in the audience as well, who's uh, uh, you worked with for this. And also thank you, Deborah, again, for attending in your comments and everyone else. Uh, just one final question, Chris, where's this work going next? Like, uh, what is down the line for you? Yeah, so I think I mentioned uh, that I'm writing up papers on this research, exploring different aspects, one with consensus making journey, uh, different parts of the World Commission dams, how the regional consultations were put in that they have had. Um, but it is very much a historical approach. Um, so trying to understand World Commission dams in that historical context, um, which I think is our niche in the wider future dams where everyone else is working on the present and future. Um, so anyone who might be interested in publications coming out of that, I would certainly share it with everyone who was interviewed, but other people should send me an email if you would like to receive news and updates about what we are writing. Uh, I'd be very happy to share that. For sure. All right. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Chris. And uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, Rose has put a link on the chat box where you can be uh, stay informed about our future webinars. And uh, the website is right there about the research we've been doing and everything. So, uh, yeah, please go look at it. Uh, and yeah, thank you again. Uh, thank you, Chris. I'm going to virtually clap. Uh, and thank you there. And <laughs> all right. Thank you for organizing and hosting. <laughs>